Okay, so the plan for today is first to review what uh, I explained yesterday, in case everybody uh, forgot. And then I will try to explain, so yesterday I started with two theorems, then I stated the general theorem and claims that the two theorems in the beginning follow from the general theorem, and I will explain how they follow today. And if there is time, I will uh, start saying a little bit about the proof of the main general result. Okay, so let's begin. Um, so just a review of the definition of dynamical cell similarity is a generalization of cell similarity where somehow what happens at each scale is driven by a dynamical system. So the dynamical system is always going to be a transitive translation on a compact abelian group. So the group is G, so uh, this uh, little G should be X, as yesterday. Then we have a contraction parameter, lambda. And then we have this map that to each point in the group assigns a purely atomic measure with a bounded, uniformly bounded number of atoms, at most C atoms for every element of the group. And then we have a tuple with all this information, I call this a model, and uh, with all this information, we build these measures that, well, these are the dynamical self-similar measures generated by this model. They are obtained by taking the infinite convolution of uh, these atomic measures. So uh, this is the atomic measure corresponding to this element of the group. So I apply the iterate the dynamic n times, and then I scale by a factor of lambda to the n. So this is the class of measures that, as I explained yesterday, includes Bernoulli convolutions, so another classical um, homogeneous of similar measures. So those correspond to the case uh, where this map delta is constant, or the group is trivial. I allow this, I allow this as well, and I try to explain uh, a non-trivial situation that I will review in a couple of slides. So, um, so let me generalize a little bit these examples that I mentioned yesterday very quickly. So uh, first of all, this definition makes sense in RD for any D. The main theorem is only in the real line. Uh, in higher dimension, things are more complicated. I'm trying to work on a generalization, but without much luck so far. So uh, the talk is about R. But okay, the definition makes sense in, in any ambient dimension. And in any ambient dimension, if we take a constant delta, we get a classical sort of similar measure where the similarities are homotheties. So this is the first example. So this is just the case where the group is trivial, the map delta is constant. But you also can take in principle Yeah, the definition makes sense for any dynamical system, but in order to have a statement for every element of the group, which is somehow, somehow the point of this, you need the action to be very rigid. So what is important is that it is uniquely ergodic. So I will come back to this uh, very soon. But in all the interesting examples I know, uh, it is actually a translation on a group. Okay, so uh, yesterday I explained, and I will review this soon, that uh, if we take uh, the natural measure on a p counter set, the natural measure on a q counter set, and I convolve them, and I can even scale one of the measures by some factor, then this fits into the framework of dynamical self-similarity, and this is a generalization. So suppose we have two contraction ratios, for example, one over p and one over q, and then we take the convolution of uh, two of the measures in the previous uh, example, basically. And, well, this is again a dynamical self-similar measure where the group depends on uh, the properties of the ratio of the logarithms. So yesterday, the ratio of the log logarithms was ir irrational. In this case, the group is uh, the circle. <coughs> But if it's rational, then the group is a finite group. If it is one, so then lambda one and lambda two are the same, then it is a trivial group, and so on. And we can do this uh, for many measures. We don't have to stop at two measures. We can do it with many measures, same idea. So in this case, uh, the group in general, if uh, all the logarithms are rationally independent, uh, together with one or something like this, yeah, actually, this is not the condition. I think it's one or, well, something like this. Under some natural condition on the, on the logarithms, the group will be a torus of dimension equal to the number of measures minus one. Okay, and in higher dimensions, we can also allow rotations. So we, we can look at the similar sets where we rotate at each step. And by definition, uh, one way of defining them is in this way. So the rotation is the same. So we have, if you look at these measures from the point of view of iterative function systems, what I'm doing is I'm scaling and rotating in the same way for all the maps. The only thing that changes is the translation. 
And these measures can also be realized in the framework of dynamical self-similarity. So don't worry too much about this because this is a higher dimensional example, which is not so relevant for today's talk, but just to show the flexibility of this construction. So O is a rotation? Just... Yeah, O is an orthogonal map in RD. Yeah. Yes. I know it's not the subject, but it's okay if you allow the O to be commuting instead of being exactly the same for them? Uh, they have to be exactly the same. They have to be exactly the same. Yeah, this is a limitation of this method. It requires to have a real, okay, so yeah. Um, it depends on what you want to prove. Actually, some results also hold, okay, so uh, yeah, so higher dimensions are more complicated, but some results, okay, no. If they are commuting, okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's more complicated. At the very least, it's more complicated, much more complicated. Okay, so, um, okay, so this is a, one of the slides that I skipped yesterday, so here it is. So again, this is the definition of dynamical similarity. So we convolve infinitely many times, and then we approximate these infinite convolutions by finite convolutions. We only convolve n times. So as, an, as I explained yesterday, these uh, measures converge to this measure weakly, which is quite natural. Uh, but these are atomic measures. So these are really purely atomic measures. Of course, if you convolve infinitely many atomic measures with the size of the supports going to zero exponentially, the end measure is, doesn't have to be purely atomic. In fact, it never is. In, in this context, and it often is absolutely continuous, which is somehow the point of, the, of everything I'm saying. But these ones, they have more and more atoms as it increases, but they are purely atomic. So these are discrete approximations to these limiting measures, and because I'm assuming that each of these measures has, has at most C atoms, each of these measures has at most C atoms because I'm just scaling, and then the support of the convolution is the arithmetic sum of the supports, so this uh, discrete approximation has at most C to the N atoms where C depends on the model, but for each model it is some constant. Okay, and then if we decompose this infinite convolution into the first uh, n terms and then the remaining terms, we have this, this condition. So this, this uh, measure is the convolution of this measure and whatever is left. And in whatever is left, we start by scaling by lambda to the n, and we start with tn to the x, uh, t to the n of x, sorry. So we get this, this uh, relationship and this illustrates why I'm calling this dynamical self-similarity. Here I'm calling it shifted self-similarity. This shows that the measure mu x, recall from yesterday that convolving with a purely atomic measure means taking this measure and taking a convex combination of um, translations of this measure. So the measure mu x is a convex combination of scaled down copies by a factor of lambda to the n, not of the same measure, but of the measure corresponding to another parameter in the group given by the dynamics. So it is not exactly self-similar, so in the classical self-similar case, here and here we have the same measure. Here we have two measures corresponding to two different elements of the groups, or elements of the group. And somehow, the reason why it's important for the main result that the, the dynamics is uniquely ergodic, so in particular a group translation, is that uh, this is a very rigid situation, so somehow all these measures look the same. Uh, they have quantitatively the same properties, something like this. I, I will give a little bit more detail uh, later today, I hope. Questions? Okay, then uh, let's move on. So I recall the definition of the Frostman exponent of a measure. So uh, I want to control the mass of an arbitrary ball. Not a typical ball, but an arbitrary ball. Of arbitrary radius, arbitrary center, everything arbitrary, with a fixed constant. The constant cannot depend on the point. So in a uniform way, I want to control the measure of balls, and the best possible exponent, so best means uh, largest is the supremum. It doesn't have to be realized. The supremum of all of this S is the, called the Frostman exponent or L infinity. I also call it L infinity dimension of the measure. I will explain later today why I call it L infinity dimension. Okay, um, and then uh, I also need, yes. I know you did it yesterday, but can we go back so I can finish? Sure, the yes. Yeah, by the way, uh, the slides for yesterday's talk, I think they are not on the website, although they are supposed to be. They are. Oh, they are. Yeah, but you have to go to the uh, page of the conference at the same website, and you uh, select abstracts. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, now that we have the magic key, <laughs> we know where, where to find the slides. And uh, yeah, the slides for this talk will also be on the website uh, soon. Is there any question or any mistake? Okay. 
Okay, so uh, then let's review the definition of exponential separation. So this is kind of, kind of a Diophantine condition, Diophantine condition on, 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 on this uh, model. So it says that things are not coming uh, too close, at, exponentially close to each other. Okay, so we have this model and we have these uh, discrete approximations to the limiting measure. So these are purely atomic me uh, measures. They have at most C to the N atoms. And exponential separation means that, that these, these atoms don't come too close together in an exponential sense. So they can be much further apart compared to the average distance, but only by, by an exponential amount. So this is what the definition means. No, no, they have to be dis distinct and, yeah, so there can be no, yeah, no exact uh, coincidence either. So they have to be really different. Okay, actually, there is, a, there is a version, sorry? I mean, if they coincide, don't they just share the weight, or? Well, if they, if they, if they coincide, then the, this, this uh, distance is zero, so. It, so you want exactly C to the, or exactly? Well, because C is an upper bound, so each, each delta measure can have a different number of atoms. Some of them, actually, in the main non-trivial example, some of them have uh, some number of atoms, so there are two, two, value for, two values for the number of atoms. But basically, I want the, this measure to have a number of atoms, which is equal to the product of the number of atoms of each of these measures. This is what I'm saying. And now, if, this, if you were doing this over a uniquely ergodic dynamical system, you would just ask for mu almost every x, or nu almost every x, or nu. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is uh, the condition. Yeah, I, I just said it yesterday. It's very important, so good that you recalled. So this has to happen at, for almost all elements of the group. Not all, almost all. This is very important because you will never be able to verify it for all. So this, the, the, this would be a theorem without examples if I was asking for this to be true for all. So it has to be true for almost all. So for us, in, um, some of us in dynamics, it's easier to think about convolutions as uh, in the con as, pu as push forwards under the context of like taking a skew product. Yes. So that you would have G on the base and then you would have Rn or whatever and the fibers. Um, and then you would have a dynamical system that scales by lambda in the fiber. Yes. And, and Rotate the, by G in the base or H. Well, the, there will be something like this, yeah. So there is a, there, there, there will be a cocycle. Well, not exactly this, we but we sort of think of these mu x's as being de degenerations of uh, some push forward of an initial measure of mu. I mean, can we uh, think of it? You know, kind of package it together in our mind to see it that way. I, I'm not. I, I'm not sure. Okay. I'm not sure. Uh, but we would start so, with like a fixed. Collection of measures so it is, it is it is a push for it is a push forward of measures on on a countable product space by a, by a, the addition map somehow so on each space you have a, you, you have like coding sequences you have coding sequences because at each at basically you can think of the measures in this way so at each step you are applying you are combining with a scaled version of this delta so this delta has finitely many atoms so you can think that you are picking one of these atoms at random according to its weight at each stage. And in this case, we have, in this way, we have a projection from some code in space. Okay, that sounds like a different way of thinking of it, but that might be useful as well. Yeah, yeah, those are, that's a little bit more concrete in some sense, uh, or maybe. Okay, okay, well, I was yeah. just intentionally <laughs> slowing you down, so go ahead. <laughs> yeah. You were very successful, okay. <laughs> okay, but even I felt that I, I was going too quickly, so, okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, exponential separation, yeah. So, yeah, this is quite weakly. Actually, the R in principle could depend on X. It doesn't have to be uniform, although it is uniform in all examples I know. And also, this has to be true for infinitely many N, not for all N. So this is actually quite important, uh, quite important. Okay, so, uh, okay, so, so far, I haven't said anything new, but, uh, so this is a review of the main theorem from yesterday. So it has some technical, so we have a model, as I described before, it has some technical assumptions which are in gray, but which are very mild. So I need some continuity of some of the maps that I defined, but the continuity has to be at almost all points. It doesn't have to be continuous everywhere. Only, again, continuous almost everywhere. And this is good because uh, in the main examples, there are discontinuities, but very few. So these assumptions are satisfied. Then I have this number that may look a little bit strange, but something I didn't say yesterday, I say now is that uh, this is very easy, so it's very easy to see that this is an upper bound for this number. So this is a natural upper bound. So if you try to think, so somehow this is what, what the real, so 
If all of the pieces in the construction were separated, like the Bernoulli convolution case when lambda is less than one half, we have a counter set, everything is separated and everything is much easier. So in that case, it is easy to see that this is really the Frostman exponent. So this is like the, what you expect the Frostman exponent to be in the symbolic situation, in the separated situation, in the easy situation. And what the theorem says is that this is also the Frostman exponent always under the assumptions of the theorem. Well, you have to assume ex exponential separation, but this is a much, much weaker condition that saying that all the pieces are really separated at every step. And again, the conclusion is true for every x in a uniform way. So this Frostman exponent holds uniformly for all elements x of the group. So there is a uniform bound for the mass of balls for all x simultaneously. So the constant does not depend on x. It depends on epsilon here, of course. But yeah, I don't know if of course. It depends on epsilon, but it doesn't depend on x. It doesn't depend on y. It doesn't depend on r. It depends on the model. So it's very uniform. Can you Could, explain uh, just for yes. the visual concept? So you have only an infinity node. So it's like a largest atom of... Sorry? Like uh, here you Yeah, an uh, infinity node is here. Yeah, but uh, like for example, it's, it's infinity. If you can go measure like n times, when the largest atoms is going to be this, but there are many, uh, but other atoms you don't have any control. You simply say the answer only depends on the largest one. Well, it's assuming exponential separation, so maybe that. Well, we, we will see that actually, the, in the way this is proved, uh, it is not proved for any, the infinity norm is bad, as everybody knows. So it's proved for LQ norms. So LQ norms look at all atoms, and how this is important in the proof. And then we let Q go to infinity, so we'll see later today. And also, in most applications, the measures delta are uniform measures on their support. So in, the, in that case, this is just one divided by the cardinality of the support of delta. So delta of x. Keep that in mind for the applications. Yes? I have probably a stupid question, but what is the difference between delta of x in parentheses and the delta of y in curly brackets? Right. So, yeah. x. Yeah, yeah, sorry about the notation, it's not, it's not the best. So x is an element of the group, and delta of x is an atomic measure that depends on x. And here, here delta is an atomic uh, measure, and this is the mass of delta at the atom y. So delta is an atomic measure, I look at the atom with the largest mass, and that's the L infinity norm of delta. So you could put an x in there, you could say the L infinity norm of, of delta of x, is the max of, of delta of x, x of y. y. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yes. But uh, maybe just to repeat the question which Friedrich asked uh, yesterday. So this uh, delta infinity is usually different from uh, total dimension? Uh, 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 L, L infinity, yeah. Infinity. The L infinity dimension of a measure is always smaller or equal than Hausdorff dimension, and very often it is strictly smaller. If the measure is alpha regular or very, very regular, they are equal. But in general, for example, there are absolutely continuous so exercise for the students or for everyone who wants to make it, do an exercise, not, not now, after the... <laughs> yeah, so there, is, there exists an absolutely continuous measure whose L infinity dimension is zero. So that's a... So on the other hand, if a measure has a bounded density, then the L infinity dimension is one. Okay, this one is trivial, but... When you say L infinity, you mean Frostman dimension? Yeah, L infinity dimension is Frostman exponent, yeah. Frostman. Yes. So the Frostman exponent can, yeah, the point is it, it can go down because you have just one bad ball. And so it's very easy to have one bad ball. Hazard dimension is, looks at typical balls. This looks at all balls. Okay, so, um, right. So uh, this has, so far has been the review of uh, yesterday. So now hopefully I will say some, something new. So, well, first let me say that uh, this is very, this theorem is very much inspired and influenced by a very important result of Mike Hoffman. And in some sense, you can look at uh, Mike Hoffman's uh, result as a version of this when only in the, okay, Hoffman has many, many generalizations, but in different directions. But if you look at the intersection, it corresponds to the case where the map delta is constant, or in other words, the group is trivial, but he looked at Hauser dimension. And looking at Frostman exponents gives uh, stronger statements because it's a stronger notion as I just explained. Okay, I think this I have said many times, but I keep insisting on it. Exponential separation has to be checked at almost all x, but the conclusion is true for all x. And I hope at the end of today's talk, or maybe at the beginning of tomorrow's talk, I will explain how we go from almost every to every, which is an important part of the proof. And 
I have already mentioned this, so it is not really important that the, there is a group and a translation. What is really important is that there is a uniquely ergodic transformation, and you, you can define some sort of good continuity properties. So certainly, if you have a uniquely ergodic transformation over a compact metric space, this is enough for the theorem to be true. So it's not important that this is a group, but in all the applications I know it is a group. Okay, so now I will explain how to deduce the two applications that I mentioned yesterday. So I start by recalling the first application. Uh, so it is a proof of uh, the conjecture of Furstenberg uh, that has the following statement. We have two bases P and Q, which are rationally independent. We have two closed invariant sets under multiplication by P and by Q. And then the theorem is that the dimension of the intersection of A and B, even if you perturb V by applying an affine bijection, yesterday's slides, it said affine, it said bijection without affine. So that's completely false. So it has to be affine or smooth. It certainly it's false for arbitrary bijections. It's even false for by Lipschitz bijections, as I said yesterday. Okay, so the dimension of the intersection is at most this natural upper bound. In fact, even the upper box dimension is, so the, I will see the proof in a minute, and you will see that the proof gives that even the upper box dimension is smaller than this number, and in general, this is larger than Hauser dimension. Okay. So uh, first, so I will explain how to deduce this from the main theorem. So the first reduction is that even though in the statement A and B are arbitrary invariant sets, it is very easy to reduce to the case where we have a P counter set and a Q counter set. And that's because if you have an arbitrary times P invariant set, you can embed it into a P to the N counter set. So you just take a very, of almost the same dimension, of almost the same dimension. So you just take a very large N, you look at the words that appear in the invariant set A, so that's an approximation to the topological entropy, which gives the dimension, because it is TP invariant, and you use this as the basis of the digits for your P to the N counter set. So, uh, so this is a well-known, so this is a well-known reduction. So, so this is the good thing about uh, needing an upper bound. So because we need an upper bound, if we may take larger sets, and we prove the upper bound for the larger sets, this also implies for the original sets. So even though intersections are difficult, the fact that we, yeah, because there is also sort of the dual problem about the sum set and that has been understood before. So for, for the sum set, in some sense, it's an easier problem, but you really need to consider invariant sets. You cannot do this reduction because you're proving a bound in the opposite direction. Okay, and uh, yeah, this is a review of something I said yesterday. Um, so we have a P and a Q counter set. We have the natural measures in them. And then if we scale one of the measures by some factor, e to the x, and we convolve. This fits into the framework of dynamical self-similarity. In fact, this example is a motivation for introducing the framework of dynamical self-similarity. Here, the group is a circle, and the map t is translation by log p over log q, which is irrational by assumption, and this is the map delta of x. So if you, if you think about this for 10 minutes, you will believe this. So this is not difficult, but I, you don't need to understand it right now. But believe me, this is, this is not, it is, first, it is true. Second, it is not difficult. Third, you need a few minutes to see it if you don't see it, but it is true. Okay, so let's think about the hypothesis of the, of the main theorem and why they hold in this case, because we want to apply the main theorem to say that the Frostman exponent of this measure is what the theorem says it is. So, well, first of all, we do have a group, we have a translation, it is transitive because log p over log q is irrational. And then I need this map to be continuous almost everywhere, and it is true because it is only discontinuous at log p and zero. And these are two points, they have zero measure, so we are fine. And also we need the measures to be a continuous function of x almost everywhere. And this is also true because there is only this continuity at zero. Because, so when zero, I mean at zero and log q, so this is the same element of the group, but it is not the same measure. But that's the only point of discontinuity. So all the hypotheses are satisfied. The only one which is not completely trivial is exponential separation. But it is very easy to check. I'm not going to do a calculation, but it is very easy to check. And as I said yesterday, it's very easy to check because uh, the group is infinite. So once you have a circle in your group, uh, you will always prove uh, exponential separation in a very easy way. Once your group is infinite, exponential separation is always easy? Well, okay. Under the other hypotheses? Okay, so you need to have a non-degenerate map delta in some sense, because if the group is infinite but delta is constant, it's like having a trivial group. Delta, yeah, this is delta of x. It is most definitely not constant. But it's not constant. It is not constant. But it's locally constant, but that's okay. It's not locally constant. No, it's not locally constant. Because of the e to the x. Yeah. Because of the e to the x. Yeah, yeah. So, so what makes this work is this e to the x here. 
Yeah, by the way, this illustrates something which is somehow well, well known is the circle of problems. Already Furstenberg used it in the 60s, but even if you only care about f equal to the identity, so if you only care about intersection, intersection A and B, you do need to consider this family. You, can, you will not ever prove anything about one, one intersection without looking at all of them at the same time. So this is an insight that really goes back to Furstenberg. Uh, Furstenberg's paper where he introduced this conjecture. And you sort of see why here, because, uh, well, it's this dynamic as a similarity that I explained yesterday. So if you zoom in into one intersection, you see an intersection with a different scaling. So you need to look at all of them at once. Okay, so uh, here is a corollary of the main result. So we have the natural measure on one of the counter sets, the natural measure on the others, and I scale by any real number, which is non-zero, of course. And then I claim that the Frostman exponent is uh, the minimum between the sum of the dimensions of the counter sets and one. And this number I call S. Okay, so this really follows from the main theorem. So I have already explained this. Wait, so, just a minute to digest the corollary statement. Yes, so sure, but. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I, I think as, as I explain why this is true, this will also help digest it. No, but you're gonna be talking more. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. So in the main theorem, it says that the Froxman exponent is an integral of the L infinity norms of atomic measures, but it really is this number in this case. So this is a trivial calculation that we are too sleepy to do right now, but. Uh, so you're saying the right hand side is the Froxman exponent? Well, in the main theorem, there is a formula. So let's go back. Yeah, there is this formula, this formula. But um, in this case, delta of x, you know how many atoms it has, and it's related to the sizes of A and B because this measure in this, for these measures, delta sub A is supported on the, atom, on the digits of A and delta sub B and so on. So you, you know exactly what this is, so you, you can calculate. And this Why is- Why does it involve Hausdorff dimension and not something else? So far, there is no house of dimension. No, so I'm saying that the Frostman exponent of the convolution. On the right hand side. And just a big measure of maximum entropy, entropy is like. Oh, here, here, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes, because the dimension of A, so A is a P counter set, which means it's defined by digit restrictions. You allow digits from a set D. I see. Oh, because. And the house of dimension is the logarithm of. Uh, log of one over log of the other. Yeah, and the logarithm of this is how many atoms you have in, in, the, in, in, the, in the delta measure. Okay, so it's just literally, you do the calculation and then you, you literally do the calculation. You compute the Hausdorff dimension. Yes, very yes, easy it's, yes, exactly, absolutely, yes. Okay, so something I have to explain. Uh, okay, this is what I have to say. And something I have to explain, in the main theorem, here instead of u, we have e to the x, where x is in the group, and the group is the interval zero log q. So, yeah, apparently we don't have this for every non-zero real, but using self-similarity, it is quite easy, so here's another exercise uh, to, to get it for all, all real u. Because you can scale the counter sets by one over p, by one over q, and the picture doesn't change. And in, the, in this way, you, I mean, once you have it on any non-empty, uh, Interval, you have it for every real number, just by scaling argument. At least for every positive one. But if you have a negative one, it's like flipping around one of the counter sets. But if you flip around the Q counter set, you have another Q counter set, you flip around the digit set. So it's the same setting. So it's, it's also true. Okay, so this is uh, what we are going to use. And now I'm going to switch to the board and uh, draw a picture or some pictures. It's a proof by picture. So is it possible to increase the lights for a few minutes? Thanks, yeah, great, thanks. Okay, so, so this is what we know. Okay, now we cannot see it, but we know something about the Frostman exponent of the convolution of, um, okay, so I will draw a picture and I explain. So I look at the product set A times B, and I have to understand this intersection where F is, is an affine map. But it is exactly the same to look at a, a linear slice of the product set. And so this slice is the graph of F. So if we understand, so here we have some counter set A here, some counter set B here. So, so we look at the intersection, so something here, and maybe something here. So if we look at the intersection of A times B with this graph, with this line L, which is the graph of F, 
This is basically just uh, looking at this set, and so the set lives here, but we just put it on the line. It is the same, by definition, because uh, if something is here, the x coordinate is in A, and the y coordinate is in, okay, it, it, it is this. Okay, so instead of looking at this, I'm going to think of this as looking at A times B intersection this line. And now I'm going to project orthogonally to this line. And this map up to reparameterization, it has the following form. Uh, pi u of xy equals x plus u1. So up to an affine transformation that doesn't change the dimension of Rossmann exponent or anything, so I'm parametrizing all orthogonal projections onto non-principal directions. So this is, this is a transversal line. So this is important because if it was horizontal or vertical, everything would be trivially false. So it is not because the map F is a bijection. Okay, so this, this line L is a fiber of this map. So I need to bound from above the box dimension of this intersection. The house of dimension or the box dimension. So by definition, if you haven't seen the definition of box dimension or house of dimension, it doesn't matter because you will see it in the argument, which is very simple. So, so yes. Sorry. F is your bijection. Your yes. Bijection. Yes. You take the graph from that. Yes. And you intersect it with a cross b. Yes. Okay. Then you have this pi u. What is u? Okay. Uh, yeah. So. U is whatever it has to be, so that this uh, line is, uh, has a direction of the kernel of pi u. So I guess is what this means. The origin, no, it's not. It's an arbitrary line. It doesn't have to go through the origin. But it's perpendicular. It's, per it's perpendicular, yeah. So we project perpendicularly to this line. We project, so that's pi u. It's just yeah, pi u is whatever, whatever projection it has to be, so that this is a fiber. So I guess it means that the slope, the slope of f has to be minus one over u. Okay. It doesn't matter, so the picture is, is much better. So in the slides, it's a minus one over u, in but. In the particular line you wrote there, it is through the origin, this, right? This line, no, the origin, this is the origin. No, 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 the, the transverse, oh. Arbitrary line, arbitrary line, it doesn't matter. Okay. So now we need to bound the, we need to give an upper bound on the box dimension of the intersection. So one way of defining box dimension is we look at the disjoint family of delta balls. So you pick your favorite small number delta, and you look at disjoint delta balls that intersect your set, because you can throw away the ones that don't. Well, actually, uh, sorry. So they have to intersect. So we need to bound from above how many disjoint balls we can have that intersect this set. If the number of, balls is at most delta to the minus s, then s is an upper bound for the box dimension and therefore for the house of dimension. Okay, but so on the product set, we have a natural measure, which is the product of the natural measures. So mu and your the natural measures on, on a and b. And we know what is the product measure of a ball because the measure, the, these measures are very simple. So the product is also very simple. So the measure of a ball of radius delta upstairs is like delta to the sum of the dimensions. Because for mu and nu, so the mu mass of a ball centered in A is like the radius to the dimension of A, and the same with nu, so we take the product, so we take the sum in the exponent. So the measure upstairs is very easy, no problem here. Okay, so the measure of the union of these balls is at most the number of balls, is at least, is at least, not at most, at least the number of balls times this number. Because each, each of these balls has at least this mass. Okay, but so where do the Frostman exponents come in? Because when we project, so if you look at some strip that has a length around delta, a bit more than delta, two delta, something like this. Well, actually, it depends on you, but this is the Lipschitz map. This is all that is important here. So they all project to some interval of length comparable to delta. And the projected measure. Actually, what is the projected measure? So I take this product measure and I project via this map. So what I'm doing is I'm scaling the y coordinate by u and then taking the addition map. By taking the addition map, it's convolving. So I first scale by nu by u and then I convolve with mu. So pi u of uh, the product measure, it is exactly what appears in the slide that you cannot see. So it's mu convolved with the scaling by u of nu. 
So we have an upper bound for the projected measure of these intervals. What? Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, so here we have the product measure, and if we project it via this map, we have here, we have exactly, we have exactly the measure whose Froxman exponent we know now. And because we know the Froxman exponent, we know we have an upper bound for the mass of this interval. But the projected mass of this interval is the mass of this strip, by definition of projected measure. So we have an upper bound for the mass of the strip. And we also have a lower bound for the mass of the strip, using the measure upstairs. So if you compare two bounds, the first number intersection conjecture comes out. So that's the proof. So as you see, it's a very simple argument. So the deduction, from, so going from the main theorem to the intersection conjecture is very simple. So you say that there is also a version of the theorem for measures, for examples of measures? Well, I, I would say this is the version for measures. The fact that the convolution has Frostman exponent as large as you could possibly expect is a version for measures. Okay. You, ah, you, you mean in the spirit of first number conjecture? In the sense ah. of dimension, you take some of the like if you can do the dimension of such measures? What measures? You take, you take you like here you choose a measure, but you can also take some other so similar. Uh, so similar. Yes, okay, so if instead of mu and nu, you have self similar measures on A and B, again, the best possible result is true. But if, if we have invariant measures, uh, then uh, it's not so clear. I mean, then I have my previous work with Mike Kochman, but uh, so yeah, this gives a much stronger result if the measures are supported on counter sets A and B such that the sum of the dimensions is less than one. Uh, but this is a quite special situation. Yes? What is the problem if you use the master screen instead of your projects in the right direction? Mar exactly what the master screen Marston's projection theorem, yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, that's what we did in a previous paper with uh, uh, Yuval Perez and Fedian Azarov. So, first, uh, Marston's projection theorem does not work for Frostman exponents. It is false. In general, it is false. Uh, so it works up to certain range. So it works for LQ dimensions up to some Q. Maybe I will mention this uh, if I have time. Yeah, probably not because, yeah. But, yeah, so we cannot use mass and projection theorem because it is not true for Frostman exponents in general. So this really depends on the self-similarity structure. Otherwise, it's, it's not true. It's not always true. Okay, can I go back to the slides? So is it possible to dim the lights again? Okay, so this is what I explained with the picture, much better with the picture. Okay, so now, now let's go to the other application, which was to uh, smoothness of Bernoulli convolutions. So, okay, so in this case, this corresponds to the case where there is no group, uh, there is no dynamics, so there is a fixed atomic measure delta. So here is the setting again, here, okay. So, it, it, so I want to look at exponential separation in this setting. So it is simpler in some sense, although it is harder to verify because the group is, well, there is no group. Okay, so in this case, the finite approximations are simpler because we are scaling by uh, power of lambda the same, the same atomic measure delta. So it is easy to see that what are the atoms of these, of these measures nu n? The atoms are polynomials with coefficients in the support of the measure. So they are p of lambda where p is a polynomial of degree at most n minus one uh, with coefficients in the support of delta. Okay, so to look at the exponential separation, we have to look at the distance between atoms, so we have to subtract two of these expressions. So, what we, so it, it is exactly this, so we, we take the difference between two atoms, now it's a polynomial in lambda, but now the digits are in d minus d, because we are taking the difference, and I want non-zero polynomials to be bounded away from zero in an exponential sense. So this is exponential separation in this setting. So in this case, it looks more like a real Diophantine condition. So in the Bernoulli convolution case, uh, d is minus one, one. So in the Bernoulli convolution case, exponential separation means that uh, the number lambda somehow is not very well approximated by roots of a minus one, zero, one polynomial, something like this. So it is not clear at all. It's a very difficult problem from, according to the experts, which I'm not, but to really understand uh, in the Bernoulli convolution case, when does exponential separation hold? For example, it is a conjecture, but apparently completely out of reach, that it holds for every transcendental number lambda in the Bernoulli convolution case. 
So this we don't know, but uh, Mike Kochman, uh, so Mike Kochman introduced exponential separation in this context, and he proved some properties that show at least in some cases we can check. If the atoms of delta are all algebraic numbers, then exponential separation holds if and only if this number is non-zero. So if it's zero, it's not true because uh, zero is not bigger than something exponential, but that this is the only obstruction when the atoms of delta are algebraic, in particular in the Bernoulli convolution case. So if lambda is an algebraic number, for example, a rational number, if lambda is a rational number, then exponential separation holds. Wait, because wait, what does it mean for the support to be algebraic? Uh, yeah, it's a subset of the algebraic numbers. Okay. All, all, all atoms are algebraic numbers. Okay, and that happens in the case of... Bernoulli convolution, the atoms are minus one and one, which are algebraic numbers. Got it. And there's exponential if and only if... If and only if lambda is not a root of a minus one, zero, one polynomial in the case of Bernoulli convolutions. So, for example, all rational numbers have this property. So, for all rational numbers... Rational? The, yeah, for all rational numbers, the Frostman exponent of Bernoulli convolutions is one. So most of you are new to this subject, so it's hard for me to convey how much the field has changed since Mike Hoffman's theorem in 2014. So this was complete science fiction. So I did my PhD with one of the experts in the area, Boris Solomiak, so I studied this for my PhD, and so we never thought anything like this would ever be proven somehow. So uh, it's, it's, it's really amazing. So no, not my result, but uh, so it really what, what everything that came out from Mike Hoffman's uh, approach, yes. So, so Hoffman's approach, like naively, you're, you're like, okay, it's a polynomial, so like, it's not a root, so Diophantine thing holds. Yes. Okay. So the hard part is verifying what, like, or what? Uh, every, everything is hard. <laughs> okay. It so is that sort of naive so. thing is just ridiculously naive. I mean, it's this. No, but you need to show that if this condition holds, then the theorem holds. Yes, because. Yeah. This is. Yeah. This is a. Yeah. This is easy fact to verify that this Diophantine condition holds is easy, but... No, the, the, the fact that the... Separation is easy or hard? No, a exponential separation for rational parameters in the Bernoulli convolution case is very easy. For rational? For rational, it's very easy. For algebraic, it is also easy. Okay. Yeah, no, this is easy. What is difficult is to prove that exponential separation implies some kind of smoothness of the self-similar measure. This is the difficult part. Ah, okay. So this part... Is this is a corollary. This is a lemma. This is a lemma. Yes. Okay. Yeah, this is just a lemma that tells you something about how prevalent exponential separation is. So in the, the first uh, item is for algebraic parameters or explicit parameters, which are important. And the second says that if you fix any atomic measure delta and you look at the contraction parameter as a parameter, then exponential separation is uh, very typical. So it holds for all lambda outside of a set of zero hazard dimension. In fact, outside of a set of even zero packing dimension. If you don't know what packing dimension is, it doesn't matter. Okay. Okay, so in particular, this is true for Bernoulli convolutions. So we have this corollary, and this is also a new result. So this wasn't known before my paper. So it was known for house of dimension, and this is the result of Mike Kochman, but this is for a Frostman exponent, so it's a stronger statement. But he it's used a, exponential separation. He introduced, he introduced exponential separation and proved something, and I proved something stronger, but as I hope to explain at some point, my proof is very much inspired by his, although it's also very different, but also, also similar. Okay, so, uh, so yesterday I mentioned this result, not about Frostman exponents, but about actual absolute continuity with LQ density. So for all lambda in the, critical re the supercritical regime between one half and one outside of a zero dimensional set of exceptions, Bernoulli convolutions are absolutely continuous and they have a density in every finite LQ. So it is, so the argument to go from this to this was already known. So it is not a completely trivial argument, but the argument already existed. So let me maybe to finish today's talk, uh, try to more or less quickly explain what's going on. So this is again the definition of a homogeneous or similar measure. And so you know this game somehow, what you always do is you decompose the convolution in some way that works for you. Uh, so we will see this again in Petter Varius part of the, of the mini course. So in this case, so this convolution I, I split into, so I fix a large number k and I look at n's which are multiples of k's and n's which are not multiples of k. 
So this part gives a measure and this part gives another measure. This part is again a Bernoulli convolution because we are looking at, so these powers are lambda to kj. So this is Bernoulli convolution with parameter lambda to the k. And this is not a Bernoulli convolution, but it is again a homogeneous or similar measure. You can write it as a homogeneous or similar measure. So you can still, uh, we can still apply the theorem to this. So we, are, we look at Bernoulli convolutions, but we need to have a theorem which is more general because we also need to understand these measures, which are slightly more complicated, but they are still so similar. Okay, and it has been known for a very long time that uh, Bernoulli convolutions, even for lambda smaller than one half, uh, they have power for a decay outside of a zero dimensional set of exceptions. Don't worry too much if you don't know what is a Fourier transform of a measure. Yeah, but this is true, and this is some notion of pseudo randomness. It shows that uh, there is not too much arithmetic structure inside the, these Bernoulli convolutions, with few exceptions. Okay, on the other hand, these measures, again, fit into the setting of uh, homogeneous or similar sets, so we can apply the main theorem to it. And if there is exponential separation for new lambda, it is easy to see that there is still, so if lambda is such that there is exponential separation here, there is also exponential separation here, because I'm throwing away some digits, so I have fewer atoms to consider somehow, to look at the separation between the atoms. So exponential separation goes from here to here. And then applying the main theorem to this measure, we know what the Frostman exponent is. And it depends on k. And this is why we need this parameter k, and we need it to go to infinity, because we need this to be one. So for every lambda, because lambda is bigger than one half, if k is large enough in terms of lambda, this will be one. So we take k large enough depending on lambda, and this is one, this is one. So what this shows is that we can decompose a Bernoulli convolution as a convolution of two measures. This one is a Bernoulli convolution again, and therefore has Fourier decay, power of Fourier decay, and this one has Frostman exponent one, using the convolution structure. And it was already known, it was proved by Boris Solomek and I, it's not too hard to prove, but not completely trivial, that in general, if you have such a decomposition, this doesn't use a similarity at, at all. So it's a general statement. If you convolve a measure that has power free ADK with another measure that has full Frostman exponent, then the convolution has a density in LQ for every finite Q. Actually, it even has fractional derivatives in LQ for every finite Q. Uh, somehow, the intuition for this is that uh, this is some condition of pseudo-randomness, so convolution is a smoothing operator. We convolve with something which is not very arithmetic, so this introduces some more regularity. And this measure is already quite close to being in L-infinity, because Frostman exponent one is close to L-infinity in some sense. So this power for ADK pushes it so to... Fractional exponents mean exponent of the sort that are related to for ADK? Yes, yes. That's how, how yeah, exactly how much fractional derivatives you have. The exponent of, of yeah. Uh, well, uh, in, it depends on Q, actually. So there is a formula. For a bigger Q, you have smaller extra fractional derivatives, as you would expect, I suppose. That's why this doesn't work for an infinity. So, uh, uh, Ada's of lambda, you've taken a, a limit. That's a good union. The, that's already absolutely continuous without infinity? Sorry? So, Ada lambda is not... It's still atomic or no? No, eta no, lambda is a self-similar measure. It's not atomic. In fact, it has Frostman exponent one, which is, so cannot be true. Very close to it's, it's very close to having a bounded density somehow. Yes. It is fractionally far. And convolving with new, yeah. Yeah, so in the proof, we have to look at the Fourier transform, of course, and it's a little bit funny, the composition argument. It takes half a page. It's not very hard. Okay, so to finish, uh, let me state, so uh, two minutes now. Okay, so to try to uh, start from a little bit more advanced point tomorrow, uh, let me quickly, so I will review this tomorrow, but so you have seen it already. So now I'm going to introduce a, a, an LQ version instead of L-infinity version of the theorem, and this is the version that is actually proved. So, so we have a measure and we look, we look at these moment sums. So these are dyadic intervals. We look at masses of dyadic intervals to the Q and we look at the growth rate as the dyadic scale goes to zero. So this captures the dyadic, uh, sorry, the, the growth rate of these moment sums and it is normalized in such a way that the result will be between zero and D. So this is some notion, reasonable notion of dimension in RD. So if a measure is like Lebesgue measure, the answer is D. If it's atomic, it's zero and so on. What do you mean intervals like Q? Yeah, cubes, cubes, we are in RD. I'm going to use this in R, but in RD they are the other cubes of side length two to the minus N. Yes. Okay, so this is some notion of dimension which is well known in uh, dimension theory of dynamical systems. 
Uh, you can look at Pessy's book, for example. So if you fix the measure, any measure, it doesn't have to be similar, as a function of Q, this is not increasing. And as Q tends to infinity, this tends to the Frostman exponent. This is why I also call the Frostman exponent an infinity dimension. It's the limit of the LQ dimensions as Q goes to infinity. And actually, the main theorem holds for these LQ dimensions. And actually, in the proof, we have to use these LQ dimensions for the same reason as uh, usual. So uh, x to the Q is a nice, strictly convex function. And uh, yeah. OK, so this is the version of the theorem for LQ norm. So this is the last thing I'm going to say today. It is very much the same statement. The only thing that changed is that instead of uh, Frostman exponent, in the conclusion, we have LQ dimension. And well, therefore, the number that we get is not the same number in general, but it is defined in very much the same way. Here we have the L infinity norm of these atomic measures. Now we have the LQ norm to the Q, and this just means adding the masses uh, to the Q. So this is a new formula, and we need this normalization so that this, uh, well, so that this is true. So given a model, so there is a model, the assumptions are exactly the same, exponential separation and the same <coughs> malcontinuity assumptions, the assumptions are exactly the same. This number now depends on Q, and the conclusion now depends on Q. And again, it is true for every element of the group or for every Q bigger than one. So actually, uh, okay, no, never mind. So the first man exponent case just follows immediately from this by letting Q go to infinity. So if we prove this, we have proved the theorem. And yeah, tomorrow I will say something about the proof of this theorem. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so you gave a proof that the density is in the Q in the previous slide. So the proof of uh, if you want to prove that density is a CK, you use similar decomposition. CK, I cannot prove. No, no, but for you say for all master like for, for several. Uh, uh, you know, for for Mastery, this is a, an argument from Erdos in the 19, 1940, and it's closely related to this power decay. Basically, you have power decay, and if you start convolving, then you have more and more decay. So this is somehow the idea. Use the convolution structure. So I split the Bernoulli convolution as a convolution of two measures, but you can split as a convolution of k measures. So multiples of k, multiples of k plus one, and so on. And each of these has, has the same power for your decay, so you convolve many times, you have more decay. If you have more decay, you have more smoothness. So that is Erdos' argument from 1940. Yeah, I think there, we don't know any other argument for this statement. This, does this? Is this recording? Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, does this only work for delta atomic measures, or can you? Well, the hardest case is when it is atomic, because if delta already is a smoother measure, then you, you expect to have a smoother result in the end. So I haven't thought about whether this concretely works for more general delta, but I would expect it in some sense. So one, one would need to think about what are, what are the assumptions. But somehow, the roughest, or the rougher that delta is, the rougher the final measure will be, so that is sort of the hardest case. Okay, so let's start the speaker again. Thank you.